Good afternoon. It's an honor to be your host today and press to all Professor Diana Azevedo. Professor Azevedo is a full professor at the Federal University of Ceará, Brazil. She has been department head, coordinator of the undergraduate and graduate program in chemical engineering, and she's today at the position of deputy director of the Technology Center. Professor Azevedo has experience in adsorption and separation process, working mainly on the following areas, synthesis of adsorbents, fundamental measure of adsorption catalysis systems, storage separation, purification of adsorption gas, and liquid phase separation process based on preparative chromatography. She's part of the board of directors of International Adsorption Society and the Superior Council of FUNCAP. She's also part of the organizing committee of the 13 Brazilian meeting on adsorption. And this year, especially and during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, she, the event will be 100% digital, scheduled for the late November. So without further ado, you're welcome, Professor Diana, and you are very pleased to have you here, and I will have the word. Thank you very much, Marlon. Good morning or good afternoon to all of you. I guess I should share my screen, yeah? Can you all see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Fred on behalf of Atoms Group for the invitation. Uh, I was a bit uh, hesitant about talking to a, a group that is a reference in Brazil and in the world in thermodynamics, not being a thermodynamic lover myself. <laughs> so, I proposed this topic of which we have been dedicating the last, uh, I would say, the last 10 years about CO2 ca uh, capture, particularly the design and optimization of cyclic adsorption processes for this application. Why and why not? And before we start, before we start, I would like to say uh, that I'm very happy to be lecturing to Atoms Group on the week that UFRJ celebrates its 100th anniversary. And although I have never studied at this university, I think I have some of the scientific DNA of UFRJ. Uh, I was uh, supervised in my master thesis by Dr. Guboli, who in turn was supervised by pioneer Giulio Massarani, the pioneer of coffee and, and UFRJ. So it's a great pleasure for me to be having the chance to share some of our research work on the occasion of Wefia Hejata's birthday. Uh, for those not familiar with the geography of Brazil, so uh, we are, our headquarters are here in Fortaleza, the capital of Ceará. Well, this picture came before I asked it to come, but anyway, that's the beautiful building of the rector's office, and this is where uh, we are located in another campus. And I chose this photo because our chair, the chair of this webinar is right here, Marlon, when he was uh, an, an undergraduate student. So uh, this, this facility was started in 2013. It's called LPACO2. So it's a laboratory dedicated to research on gas phase absorption uh, with a particular interest in CO2 capture. Actually, the research group I belong was started in 1994, and along the years, it has spread its uh, uh, research interests to various areas, not only adsorption, but I'm highlighting here uh, the area that I've, I've been dedicating most of my efforts in the last few years. Okay, uh, I do not mean to lecture about why it is important for the world to capture CO2. So I, I will go straight to this cartoon, which is uh, very often found in IPCC documents. Uh, so it sketches at least four scenarios where uh, CO2 is emitted and therefore uh, where it can be captured. And the idea of the CCS processes, carbon capture and storage technologies, is to capture CO2 from its emission point. And this, these three scenarios that we have here, post-combustion, pre-combustion, and oxy-fuel, are related to the generation of energy. Unlike Brazil, most of the world runs by thermal energy, by burning fuels and coal. 
so uh, we are concentrated on this scenario, the post-combustion scenario. That's why uh, one of the funding uh, bodies that you will see of this research is uh, a thermal company. So the idea is to separate CO2 from whichever gas it is emitted together with, concentrate it and store it uh, for an indefinite period of time, or utilize it to generate uh, valuable goods, for instance. So we will concentrate on CO2 and 2 separation in, in, in this talk. And uh, obviously all of you know very well the difference between adsorption and absorption. But I brought these two cartoons because they essentially concentrate the two competing technologies. So uh, in sour gas removal, CO2 removal, uh, the competing technology to absorption is usually absorption, which is much more mature in many cases technologically, with a lot of drawbacks that I'm not going into detail. But anyway, uh, on one side, you have a solubility phenomena. And on the other side, adsorption, you have a deposition, or it's an interface phenomenon, a, a deposition of molecules that may or may not retain its chemical identity when they concentrate in the vicinity of this interface between the fluid, usually between a fluid and a solid. So uh, if you're trying to capture CO2 by adsorption, what should you look for in a CO2 adsorbent? Uh, since it's a surface phenomena, you're looking usually for high surface area, and we're talking about hundreds or thousands of square meter per gram. Uh, you're looking for high retention capacity for the target molecule, in our case is CO2. Most known adsorbents adsorb preferentially CO2 to the other gases that are together with it in the emission scenarios. This may be either through sieving effect, which is hardly the case because CO2 is a quite small molecule of comparable size with nitrogen, uh, methane, and other molecules, or some, chem some type of chemical or electrostatic interaction. You expect CO2 to have high selectivity. Uh, we're talking about cyclic processes. That's the title of the talk. So you're interested in adsorbents that can be regenerated and used psychically. Uh, you, you also expect low enthalpy, so that it requires less energy to desorb what has been previously absorbed. And of course, since it's cycles, uh, you're expected to have high hydrothermal and mechanical stability. So I sketch it here. Uh, cyclic processes usually have a stage where adsorption is carried out and you produce a light product, usually nitrogen enriched or methane enriched. And in another moment or in another place, you're performing desorption of what has been previously absorbed. So this is more beautifully sketched here. You may have cyclic batches, which are essentially one or more fixed beds uh, that uh, in a synchronous way uh, shift adsorption steps with desorption steps. Or you may have also continuous operation by having the adsorbent solids to move. So if we have an ingenious way of moving the solid, the adsorbent, you may cycle it between the adsorber and the desorber. Uh, and you may produce uh, uh, in a continuous way the light product, which is enriched in the less adsorbed component, and the heavy product, which is enriched in the uh, strongly absorbed component, in our case, CO2. Uh, I would like to take the chance of this slide to advertise the chapter for those who are interested in learning a bit more about the basics and fundamentals of adsorption. Uh, a chapter has just been published in Kirk Othmer, Encyclopedia of Techn uh, Chemical Technology. Uh, our group here authored this chapter. Actually, it was originally written by Doug Ruthven, and we had the honor to update and revise and publish a new edition of this chapter, which has just been released. When we talk about desorption, so how can you extract what has been previously adsorbed? You can do that by swinging the temperature, by rising the temperature. You can do that by lowering the pressure with respect to the 
adsorption pressure. You can do that by using another molecule, another component which is preferentially adsorbed, or simply by purging if the species are weakly adsorbed. Uh, I ask you to excuse me, but I like this graph, even though it's in Portuguese, just to show you that if we look at the equilibrium equation or the so-called adsorption isotherm, which relates the concentration in the fluid phase in equilibrium with the concentration in the solid phase, then you may have uh, several uh, uh, behaviors. We're generally looking at isotherms that are favorable or strongly favorable. If they are too strongly adsorbed, possibly you will have to use temperature to desorb, and you will be subject to some of the disadvantages of using temperature thermal inertia, the thermal aging of the adsorbent, uh, the heat losses that are inevitable in, in, in most heating and cooling processes. Uh, if you have an isotherm that is linear, for instance, you will probably sort to uh, purging or elution desorption. Okay, so here we have also a cartoon which pictures a very well-known cyclic separation process. Uh, this is a PSA intended for separation of nitrogen and oxygen from air. Uh, you will need a compressor because one of the columns will be absorbing, whereas the other column will be desorbing what had been previously desorbed. Well, these columns are filled or can be filled or packed with different sorbents. And the key is choosing a sorbent together with the operating conditions, the times required for each step that will give you good performance. And when I talk about good performance, I'm talking about the purity of the two streams, the light product stream and the heavy product stream, the recovery with respect to what has been fed to the unit, uh, the productivity, which impacts on the size of your unit, and of course, the energy consumption. Having said that, that was just uh, an overall uh, view of capture processes and cyclic absorption processes. Uh, I, I, my talk in the following will be made of three parts. I will comment a little bit on adsorbents for CO2 capture with some mention of work we have been doing here in our institution. And then we will show two case studies, uh, pressure swing adsorption unit to separate CO2 and a moving bed temperature swing adsorption, both cyclic processes. In one, you will see the concept of cyclic batches, fixed bed, and the other one, you will see a continuous process for the moving bed. Uh, talking about adsorbents for CO2 capture, this is a review that is now almost 20 years old. And by this time, uh, this figure, this graphical abstract, tried to show some sorbents together with its uptake for CO2. And as a function of temperature, all of these are at one atmosphere. So at moderate temperatures, and we're talking about most capture processes that happen here, you had the usual activated carbon, zeolites, uh, and hybrid, organic, inorganic hybrids. If you're talking about capture at much higher temperatures, then uh, you go to oxides, hydrotalcides, zirconates. And uh, it's interesting because by then, I added this arrow here. By then, MOFs were not even considered. Well, up to now, you have hundreds of papers of MOFs, actually. But to my knowledge, no real process uh, with packed beds using metal organic frameworks, which by chance, they are organic, inorganic hybrids, as most of you know. But this is just to show how uh, the, the materials development research has evolved since then, targeting at CO2 capture. Uh, I tried to summarize some of the main materials we have been using in the laboratory. All these were isotherms measured in our lab. So we have uh, two temperatures approximately room temperature, 25 degrees C and 75 degrees C. We're always interested in checking this temperature because it's considered in the literature as a reference for the feed of flu gases uh, for the sake of CO2 capture. Uh, you can see that um, nobody beats zeolite 13X, 
even though its capacity decreases as the temperature increases, it still has got pretty much high uptake, around five millimoles per gram adsorbent. Uh, you have uh, less favorable isotherms in general for activated carbons, and uh, MOFs are in between, uh, and other materials. But uh, you see that the pressure range is quite high, and maybe we would be interested in, in, in taking a closer look at the low pressure range. So in the low pressure range, you see some, some differences. Uh, this material in green starts to stand out not because it's the second one to absorb more within the region of partial pressure of flue gases, which is around uh, 0.15, from 0.05 to 0.15, but also because if you check the rising temperature, the isotherm remains almost unchanged or even increases. Uh, this is a material that we have been developing together with the, the University of Malaga. It's a modified silica in order to increase on the surface and in the pores the number of amino groups that can interact more strongly with CO2. And therefore, the absorbent is less prone to decreasing its capacity at higher temperatures. So uh, three temperatures, th two uh, examples of crystalline solids. Uh, MOFs, at least this MOF is not the best MOF for this application, but we chose it because it's quite robust in the presence of uh, water vapor. And as you can see, uh, it absorbs much less than Zeolite 13X, but it has an advantage. It is much easier to uh, desorb upon temperature decreases than Zeolite 13X, which is really uh, has really a sharp increase at low pressures. Two types of activated carbon, regular activated carbon sold by Norit. And, and you see that the, at low pressures, it, it really absorbs very little as compared to zeolites. Uh, this is an activated carbon developed together with Universidad Autónoma de México. Uh, and, and this one has in its structure a lot of nitrogen groups. And therefore, you see that uh, the isotherms are, are, are steeper than those isotherms in, in the case of regular uh, activated carbon. And finally, the silica, which I mentioned to you, and there's something interesting about this silica. As you rise the temperature, the isotherm also rises. Eventually, if you keep rising the temperature, CO2 will be desorbed. Uh, we have done this, this test as well. But within the range that you expect to have a, a flue gas feed, uh, it uh, increases the, the uptake upon temperature increases. So then it comes the question with such a huge variety of solids, both commercially available or under development, how can you screen them if you don't have enough amount of adsorbent to pack a column uh, or to pack a, a, a PSA setup to make experiments? So there have been some attempts in the literature to uh, propose indexes, to propose figures of merit that uh, can rank adsorbents. And possibly this API is one of the most recent ones. It was proposed in 2013. And uh, you calculate it by knowing the working capacity, which is the difference between the uptake in the adsorption conditions and in the desorption conditions, you have the selectivity over the competing gas, and you have the enthalpy of absorption. And all of these are elevated by indexes, A, B, C, and depending on, on, on the target, if you want to purify or if you want a bulk separation, you can tune these uh, indexes. But still, this is not the only figure of merit. Actually, as I said, this is the most recent one. Uh, there have been uh, at least a handful of other figures of merit proposed in the literature. And I like this work, which I shall use as a reference. It was published by the group of the University of Alberta, where they compare four adsorbents, two MOFs, a zeolite, zeolite 13X, and an activated carbon, and calculate all these figures of merit for them. The underlined figures stand for the winner from the point of view 
of each of these uh, figures of merit. And you can see that depending on the way you look at the problem, you can have different winners, let's say. So how to choose? So what he did was, he, here are the CO2 isotherms of the four materials under study. Maybe Professor Ranjitran is listening to us <laughs> in the YouTube channel, who knows? And he proposes one VSA cycle, V from vacuum, because adsorption happens at nearly atmospheric pressure and desorption occurs at vacuum. The system has to be evacuated to extract CO2. So by fixing a cycle configuration, and I won't go into detail, but by fixing the cycle configuration, uh, he with the data from the four adsorbents, you see that activated carbon has already been discarded and we stay with two MOPs and the zeolite and the energy consumption for that cycle is measured together with the productivity in terms of moles of captured CO2 per volume of adsorbent per second. And what we can see here is that the adsorbent with a higher CO2 uptake, which is the magnesium MOP, is the one that requires more energy for CO2 capture under lower productivity. And so two lessons were important here. One lesson is that the adsorbent with the highest CO2 uptake is not the most energetically efficient. Possibly the magnesium MOP was the winner from the point of view of various of those figures of merit, but you should test it uh, under real conditions and, and maybe what the figures of merit say or indicate is not what you have in terms of performance parameters. If your target is minimizing energy or maximizing productivity, for instance. Something else I'd like to call your attention is the range of pressures for desorption. This is in bars. So you have here 0.03 bars required for this, uh, for the separation, for this capture to, to get. And another lesson from, very important from this paper is that nitrogen adsorption is important too. If you look at the nitrogen isotherms, the magnesium isotherm is also the one who absorbs the competing gas the most. So this has an impact also on these results. Why have I shown you all of this? Just to, to try to convince you, and I hope that I have, that modeling tools are essential for you to make a screening between adsorbents and then go to process design uh, protocols into detail. So with that, I come to the second part of my talk where I will show you some results and some of the things we have been doing concerning pressure swing adsorption. But maybe before I should make reference to the first PSA cycle ever uh, 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 shown, proposed in the literature. It's a US patent that dates back to 1958, proposed by Skarstrom. And until today, this is called the Skarstrom cycle, which is composed essentially of four steps. And what you see here is what happens in each time. So this axis here stands for time. This axis here stands for pressure regarding this first column here. So we have an initial pressurization step and the column may be closed in the other end or with a much lower flow rate so that this column can be pressurized. Then you have a feed, you establish the flow and that's where you get the light product, which would be enriched in our case in nitrogen. And the pressure is more or less constant. Then uh, this column is possibly, is probably saturated with the heavy component with CO2. You have a blowdown step, which is a depressurization and a purge step. If you combine two columns, then this purge step may be a part of the light product coming from the second column. And then you, you, you could synchronize these two columns to have a nearly constant uh, flow rate of the light product and of the heavy product. What I would like to call your attention is that PSA has this name because the adsorption step happens upon pressurization. You need a compressor and the blowdown usually is to the atmosphere. But you could have as the example that I had just shown, uh, the pressurization, let's say, or the feed 
under atmospheric pressure and the blowdown under vacuum, in which case it would be VSA. So this has also been proposed, the same cycle, although it looks different here, in 2011. Not for the first time, but I, I think this is a very interesting work that proposes, proposes the Skarstrom cycle for biogas upgrading. In this case, to enrich methane and get rid of a great part of the CO2 that comes with biogas in order to produce what is called now biomethane. Uh, the next slides are just to show that the Skarstrom cycle can be sophisticated. In which way? You have here two columns. These are the four steps that I showed. Pressurization, absorption, blow down and purge. But in between, uh, when you decrease the pressure and when you increase the pressure, you can have, if you have two columns, you can have equalization steps. So you connect the two columns so that you have an intermediate depressurization in the case of column A and an intermediate pressurization in the case of column B. Uh, and in the following, we will show that this sometimes is a good strategy to enhance the recovery of uh, the light product, which is usually low in pressure swing absorption processes. Uh, this is uh, the sketch of the unit to separate hydrogen from CO2 uh, that is set up in the Petrobras unit here in Fortaleza called uh, Lubinor. So they need pure H2. That's a bit easier separation because H2 sticks to nearly nothing. But anyway, the, there are four columns and uh, the cycle is as complex as this one. I'm not going into detail, but you can see that there are a lot of equalization steps and purging steps, intermediate purging steps for the four columns. So all of these strategies, increasing the number of columns, including uh, internal cycles or equalizations, usually aim to enhance uh, the, the, the performance uh, parameters that I, we talked about purity, recovery, productivity, and energy consumption. With that, I come to the unit, the, the dual bed PSA unit that we have installed in our lab. These are the columns. They are approximately uh, up to one meter long and one centimeter internal diameter. Uh, you have uh, five temperature probes, these yellow stubs here, that are placed along the axis of the column. Uh, you can understand better how it works here. It's very similar to the schematic drawings that we just saw. So you have a separate manifold area and you can also uh, sample the light product so that you can analyze the composition by gas chromatography. This is a PSA unit, not a VSA unit. So the results uh, we're going to show here stand for pressurized feed. Some general features of the PSA, which I have already told you about maybe in the previous slides, are that the light product or the refinite can be obtained in high purity. You will always have very pure nitrogen depending on the, the, the residence time that you apply. But usually the, your extract will have very low purity or speaking in other terms, the light product will be recovered with very low recovered. Uh, you can, enhance that or improve that a little bit by including more columns or a more sophisticated cycle. But of course, this will have also a cost. Uh, the energy efficiency, efficiency is relatively low because PSA essentially uses mechanical energy. So the cost of energy is the largest component cost in this type of operation of cyclic processes. So if the feed stream is available at high pressures, and that's not the case of flue gases, unfortunately, but it is the case, for instance, of natural gas sometimes exploited offshore. So if the feed stream is available at high pressures, these costs can be drastically reduced. So uh, the unit cell of a PSA cycle, since it's a cyclic batch process, is a fixed bed. And therefore, uh, in the next few slides, we will be talking about fixed bed modeling. I will not show you equations. They are hidden if we need to show them uh, during the, 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 the session of questions. But these are the assumptions, common assumptions 
the gas phase behaves like a mixture of ideal gases. Maybe this is the most questionable one, but the other ones are rather regular uh, uh, assumptions. There is thermal equilibrium between the gas and adsorbent particles at all times and in all places. Uh, we're only considering temp uh, gradients actual, actually. And uh, as I said, I'll not show you the equations, but I'll just come to, if we consider a binary system, for instance, CO2 and nitrogen, we will come to 12 equations among mass balance equations, energy balances, momentum balances, equilibrium relationships, and 12 variables for the binary system. So together with the convenient boundary and initial conditions, we have a well-posed system. Now, along the presentation, I have some warnings for you. And the first one is the need to account for that volumes. So this, this is a sketch of what our column in our lab is like. So you look at the column, only a fraction of it is actually filled with adsorbent, especially because very often you do not have available that amount of adsorbent to fill everything. So you have uh, some dead volumes inevitably. And these dead volumes, when we're talking about breakthrough curves of a single column, they are easily handled. You just shift the breakthroughs, the, the, the concentration fronts, uh, X unit time units referring to your dead volume. But when you connect this with two columns, three or four columns in a PSA setup, that makes a difference. Uh, this is just to show you that to describe the dead volumes, you use the same equations, but with no adsorption on. Uh, this was a, a, a paper that we presented in EBA 12, the last one. Gives me a chance to talk about EBA 13 at the end of my presentation. And the main results are these ones. The process performance parameters, especially recovery and productivity, do decrease when you increase the fraction or the percentage of that volumes uh, with respect to the total volume of your unit. So this should be carefully be taken into account in your PSA or VSA model, because if you don't consider them, you may be underestimating or overestimating the performance of your unit. Okay, uh, I didn't show the equations, but of course there are lots of input parameters to be informed so that you can run this model. So this is just a, a, a brief toolkit for model parameter determination. In blue, you have all of the parameters that you should either measure or calculate or estimate by correlations. So from the, the porosity of the bed up to the heat of absorption of the components involved, CO2 and nitrogen. Um, you will sometimes have to use correlations, especially to get heat parameters, like specific heats of the gas absorbent, uh, heat transfer coefficients. And then I come to the meat of the talk, uh, to our results. So what we have here on the left and on the right are two activated carbons, they are commercially available. And we have CO2 and nitrogen breakthroughs. They are, these experiments have been made with pure gases, diluted in helium in some cases. But I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the points are experimental data measured in the gas chromatograph that we showed. But the curves are modeling results with parameters that were measured independently. So this is not a spline, or this is not a curve that is fit to the experimental data. This is a prediction, and the prediction is quite well. Uh, experiments match the simulation in both cases. And the same happens sometimes with deviations, especially in the case of nitrogen, for the temperature probes. So in each of these graphs, you have four of the five temperature probes of our unit. Uh, they are positioned in, in different actual, axial positions. And you can see that there's a reasonable agreement between experiment and uh, data. Um, my second warning, when we come now to mixtures, we will soon see breakthrough of mixture CO2 and nitrogen. So you should be careful about the multi-component adsorption model that you use. So you may use 
simple models such as the extended Langmuir or the extended SIPs, which has an additional parameter, or uh, the good and old ideal absorbed solution theory. And I won't go into detail either about them, but I would like to draw your attention to these graphs. The dots that you have here are experimental data for total adsorbed concentration of nitrogen CO2 mixtures. Uh, experimentally, the device we have available at the lab only allows us to measure the total adsorbed concentration. And what you see here, the curve, the dashed curve and the continuous curve are predictions from the ideal adsorbed solution and the SIPS model. And you can see that both predict very well for the two activated carbons, the total adsorption. But then when you come to the green and the red lines, which would stand for the amount of CO2 and nitrogen that sum this, what you see is that the two models predict different individual amounts of each gas. And therefore they will uh, uh, give you different selectivities and very likely they will give you different breakthrough curves and different performances of your uh, PSA unit. And that's what we see here. Well, we have here breakthroughs of mixtures. This one with the roll-up effect stands for nitrogen and these ones stand for CO2 in two different temper, uh, sorry, the three curves stand for three different uh, pressures of the feed. So we have six bar, 12 bar and 18 bar. And what we have on the left is the model predictions using ideal absorbed solution as your uh, equilibrium model, multi-component equilibrium model. What we have on the right is the SIPS model and you can see deviations in this case. The same happens with another activated carbon and the deviations for SIPS are even worse and especially at high pressures. The higher the pressure is, the stronger the deviations or the more intense the deviations are. And with that, I have shown you some breakthrough curves for a fixed bed. We come to the PSA model, which is essentially the same as the, the, the fixed bed model. The equations are the same, but you should be careful about the boundary conditions, which will change periodically and the initial conditions in each case. Uh, be careful also to integrate the dead volumes and also be careful with the multi-component equilibrium model that you use, the two previous warnings I gave you. So I will show you only a simulation that we performed together with experiments under these conditions, drawing your attention to the fact that the feed enters at high pressure, six bar, and the blowdown pressure is atmospheric pressure. Uh, the composition of CO2 is typical of the composition of flue gases. And we are considering that the gas is dry, which is not the case in real situations. But for the sake of simplicity, uh, we considered a dry feed. And then what we have here are how the pressure varies points are experiments, lines are simulations. And you can see the Skarstrom cycle clearly, pressurization, absorption, blowdown, and purge and a very good agreement between experiment and simulation. The same happens with the temperature probes. We have here the results for four temperature probes. And the same happens to the performance parameter, product, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, light product productivity. I'm sorry, purity. So what we have here, the points are the purity of the light product that was measured along the cycles together with the prediction from uh, the, the, the simulator. And here we have simple predictions only. This is the product recovery, the light product recovery. If there was no equalization step, it would be here with equalization step, we can enhance a bit further, but we will comment on that in the following. Uh, this is also simulation, even though we have points here, but this is just for you to see how the concentration front inside the column, this is axial position, and CO2 mole fraction. This is how CO2 concentration varies in the adsorption step along different time intervals. Uh, 
Uh, I draw your attention to the dot volumes in the beginning and in the end of the column. So if we choose these times and make various simulations of the PSA cycle, assuming these times as the time of the adsorption cycle, this is what we get. So uh, we can check how the, the, the parameters, in this case, nitrogen purity varies if the cycle is long enough. If the cycle is long enough, you will start having uh, CO2 coming, leaking from the column and therefore uh, interfering in the purity of the light product. You can also make this type of arrangement uh, by increasing the time of the adsorption step, which, is, which defines the rest of the cycle. You can check the effect of that on purity and recovery. And the points I drew here in yellow stand for the concentration of CO2 in the feed and the concentration of nitrogen in the feed. So it's relatively easy to come to pure nitrogen, but you lose a lot of nitrogen to the other product. And therefore, the purity of the extract of the product containing CO2 is only slightly enhanced. In, in terms of energy consumption, you have a, a steady increase of energy consumption as you increase the time of the absorption step. Uh, I think I should move a little bit faster. <laughs> this is the third warning and uh, I think the last one, it's about the equalization step, which is a way of increasing recovery. So what you have here is the recovery of nitrogen without equalization step and with equalization step. But before I go to the last part of my talk, what we can conclude from this, and I shall go back to it in a wrap-up slide at the end, is that PSA uh, operation uh, is, is not, uh, if, if what you're looking for is high CO2 purity, then PSA is not the operation of choice because you will inevitably, no matter how sophisticated the cycle is, have a low recovery or not a high recovery of the nitrogen. And therefore you will have a heavy product stream that has a low, uh, 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 a low concentration in CO2. So if, you, if your objective is just getting rid of CO2 emissions, you can do that, but the cost is high because you will have the other product very dilute still. That's why we move to the last part where we propose now a moving bed temperature swing absorption device. Uh, what we have in this case is a real circulation of solids so that the solid moves counter current to the gas feed, the flue gas, and absorbs CO2. Then it moves to the desorption section where heat is provided so that CO2, a CO2 rich stream can be obtained. And finally, before coming back to the absorption section, this solid must be cooled. So you must extract heat. So it's essentially a problem that has to do with heat integration. And uh, you have a lot of heat available in a thermal plant. So it's a chance uh, you know, to implement a process that, that, that can maximize uh, this heat exchange with the other parts of the unit. So this concept was originally patented by Kent Nabel in 2013. And Kent has been a partner with us and also personnel from SACT. This is a small university located in Criciúma. Criciúma is in the middle of a, a coal uh, mining uh, area and also supported by uh, Eneva. So again, this is the same concept. Uh, first, you should dry the flue gas before it enters here. And I will show you why. This is the typical concentration of CO2 in the flue, uh, the flue gas. Countercurrent move in this section will allow to obtain a nitrogen enriched stream and the adsorbent full of CO2 will come to the desorption section where it's going to be heated and therefore desorb CO2, then be cooled and come back to the cycle. 
Why have we added this prior drying uh, step here? Because Zeolite 13 X, that's the material of choice for the packing of our TSA unit, is highly hydrophilic, hydrophilic. And this can be seen by this adsorption isotherm of water at 50 degrees C. Moreover, if you measure the isotherm of pure CO2 as compared to the isotherms of CO2 for pre-humidified uh, zeolite, that's what we tried to represent here, increasing amounts of pre-adsorbed water, what you will have is a sharp decrease in the amount of CO2 in the uptake of CO2. So a drying step is necessary. And this drying step, the energy requirements for this dry, drying step is taken into account in our calculations. I should say that what I'm going to show you is purely simulation work. So it's proof of concept. Uh, the moving bed model, I think uh, I should have only 10 more minutes maybe. So the moving bed, yes, Marlon, thank you. So the moving bed model is quite similar to the fixed bed model. Of course, you have to take into account the countercurrent move of the solid. And this is taken into account here in the mass balance for the fluid phase, the mass balance for the solid phase. We have this convective term that stands for the movement of the solid and the classical equations. Uh, this is not mass balance, I'm sorry, it's heat balance for the wall, uh, the momentum balance, uh, and the uh, general energy balance for the inner contents of each column. So of course, uh, the boundary conditions will vary if we're talking about the adsorption section, the desorption section, or the cooling section. And then I come to uh, the algorithm that you, you, we use to generate the results that I'm going to show in the following. So by fixing the flue gas flow, the regeneration temperature, the solid residence time, and the flue gas inlet temperature, we started varying the solid loading and checked the performance parameters. We did everything again with another set of, blue, of these parameters here. Uh, I cannot disclose the real values here because this is under a secrecy contract. What I will tell you is that the flow rates used were a given flow rate F, which has been increased 20% and 50%. This is the inlet flow rate of the flue gas. Uh, I can say that the re regeneration temperatures under study were these three, 200, 220, and 240. If you try to regenerate a, a pack of zeolite in a molten furnace, usually it will require 300, 350 degrees C. So that, this more or less guided us in choosing these regeneration temperatures. Uh, the solid residence time, uh, we, we, we fixed it as tau, we doubled four times as much, eight times as much, and we assumed that the flue gas inlet temperature was 50 degrees C. So the first thing we did was uh, by varying the solid flow rate with the reference case, I mean uh, F flow rate and tau residence time, what we observed is that as you increase the solid flow rate in units of mass per time, in terms of recovery of CO2, now you will get a maximum beyond which this recovery will decrease. And this can be explained if you take a look at the concentration profiles of CO2 and nitrogen inside the adsorbent column. So the liquid the liquid, no, I'm sorry, the gas flows in this direction to the right and the solid flows in this direction to the left. But as you increase the solid flow rate, you will push these profiles to the left and the same thing with the nitrogen isotherm. And as you decrease the solid flow rate, so you will allow some of the CO2 to leak through the column and contaminate your light product. This is what happens with the temperature profile. So it's very similar. We did the very same study, but taking a look at the energy consumption and you will find a minimum 
we're always very interested in finding minimum or maxima uh, in, in a given solid flow rate. If then you fix the regeneration temperature and you use different flow rates and the different residence times that we mentioned and plot all the performance parameters in the same graph, here you can only distinguish between the flow rates, but it becomes clear that lower flow rates, gas flow rates, tend to give you high purities and recoveries. And that's why in the following we chose the lowest F, the lowest uh, inlet flow rate of the three. And now we examine the effect of the regeneration temperature, but this time we fixed the flow rate of gas and we varied the solid residence time. And by doing that, it's interesting that we see the same trend between these four residence times that we uh, tested. Uh, they all have the same format, like this curve here, but one common feature is that as you raise the regeneration temperature, this moves to the left, to the right, and up so that at 240 degrees C, you can get higher recoveries and higher purities. This is more or less intuitive because uh, supposedly you clean better the adsorbent. So uh, the next slide. Now we fixed not only the gas flow rate to the unit F, but we also fixed to the regeneration temperature and we observed, even though we vary here the solid residence time eightfold, they all follow for each performance criteria a common trend. And again, for a given solid flow rate, we have a minimum of energy consumption. Uh, having said that, the last effect I want, would like to show you is also very intuitive. If you increase the feed temperature of the gas, then all performance parameters are worsened. You decrease the purity, you decrease the, the recovery, and you increase the energy consumption because you will have more saturated water in equilibrium with these feeds at higher temperature, and thus it will require more energy to dry the gas before CO2 capture. I know I went very quickly over this last uh, case, over the last part in the interest of time, but what I wanted to show you is that uh, we can have a powerful simulation tool. It has not been validated experimentally yet, but it allowed us to get energy consumptions in the range of 0.7 to 1.2 megajoules per kilogram captured, which is more or less in the same order of magnitude of the PSA with activated carbon, with the advantage that now I have both high purity and high recovery. And moreover, these calculations include also flue gas drying. Of course, they need validation. But anyway, they're much superior to the first case I showed. And they are comparable with the VSA that has been published, which I showed uh, to you. Although this case does not include the energy required for gas drying, because the gas is assumed to enter the unit dried already, no presence of water. And if I compare these figures with uh, what is in the literature about the energy requirements for absorption with liquid amines, then we can say that we have uh, uh, absorption-based project, absorption-based processes, which compete quite well with uh, liquid amine systems. And I think this is the slide that summarizes uh, most of, the, of what I intended to bring to you this afternoon, this early afternoon. So uh, I would like to end by thanking especially the two PhD students. They are both Rafael, Rafael Siqueira, who did his PhD on PSA, and Rafael Morales, who is on, in progress uh, with TSA, moving bad TSA. And I should also give special thanks to Emeritus Professor Eurico uh, and to visiting Professor Enrique, 
Both of them helped me a great deal in preparing this presentation. And of course, I do acknowledge the help of the whole team of LPA CO2. And I have also to acknowledge funding, funding from different bodies. Uh, in, since the very first beginning, Petrobras has uh, supported the lab uh, in CO2 capture uh, scenarios. And more recently also with funding from uh, energy, from the energy sector. So with that, I would also like to encourage all of you to join the Brazilian meeting on absorption. It was supposed to have been held in May in Fortaleza, but unfortunately due to the pandemic, we had to make this decision of postponing it and so that it can happen in 2020 and for the safety of everyone, it's going to be fully virtual. Uh, this is what the app that you can install in your mobile device looks like. So uh, there will be exclu exclusive content for those that join the meeting. Uh, we will be publishing an ebook with the proceedings of the conference. Special journal issues are already negotiated with three journal issues. The Brazilian Absorption Society is going to be inaugurated during the events. And for those that missed all the deadlines for paper presentations, but still would like to attend, there are special discounts. I hope that I've made a good propaganda out of it. And with that, uh, I would also like to show you some of the invited speakers already confirmed for EBA 13. One of them is an old friend of ours, Professor Marcelo Castier. And with that, I thank you for your attention for this nearly an hour. And I would be glad to discuss or answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Diana, for the marvelous presentation. And just to let you know, between here and our YouTube channel, we got almost 100 simultaneous views. And we are now officially open for questions. If you want to ask one, please enable your microphone or any other YouTube views can also uh, write it down and you read it. Uh, but for the first question, I would like to ask if any of our international guests would make this uh, first question, Professor Diana. So any questions? Normally, I and, and Rajagopal start, but uh, I'd like to open uh, the microphone for people abroad uh, to have a chance to ask, Diana. Uh, if not, I, I start, but <laughs> I, I'd like to... I have uh, a question, uh, Fred. <laughs> okay, you are not... Abroad, but <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for someone abroad, but no one talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Ashimiru. <laughs> hello, Diana. How are you? I'm fine, Aji. How yeah, are you? So long. That's good. Okay, Diana, I, I love very much your presentation. You talk about many things about the, the absorption, PSCA, VSCA, TSCA, so on, in modeling, so on. It's a very nice presentation you had. Uh, but I, my question regarding your uh, last uh, slides, then you saw that table comparing PSCA, MBS, TSCA, VSCA. But I, I was missing in that table the, the comparison with the TSA, not moving back to TSA. What's your impression about this? If you add this uh, line in this uh, table, what will be the result of, of that? Uh, to be honest, I have no such data <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> but usually... comparing the TSA with MD TSA, what, what do you think about this? Uh, well, on without making too many calculations, I would say that you will have uh, low productivity because uh, with fixed beds and you alternate between uh, an adsorption cycle and then a desorption cycle where the bed would be fixed and you would be heating up the bed, mm -hmm. you usually have a lot of uh, inertia, thermal inertia, yeah. which Therefore. in a way is uh, eliminated or at least uh, much better when you have counter current move and and so well without thinking too much that's what i would say 
Uh, and with the amounts of flu gas that you're supposed to treat, uh, I think it would be a safe bet to say that a fixed bed TSA would be much less effective, both in terms of energy use and also in terms of productivity. Mm -hmm. What about the, the lifetime of the particles that absorption part in, in this uh, moving uh, bed approach? That's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Yes, because uh, the way that you shape the particles and what you use in the shaping process will make a difference in their durability, in their uh, resistance to attrition, to friction. But th this is part of what I cannot tell you much about, but yes, it makes a difference. There have been previous attempts of making uh, moving beds uh, which have failed or which have been abandoned precisely because of that attrition yeah. and eventually a risk of a uh, fire uh, also. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is something that the consortium that I told you about is looking into. All right. Thank you, Diana. Diana, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it was lovely. Uh, I'm very curious about the data that you sh have shown us uh, uh, about uh, when you increase temperature, you increase the absorption. Uh, it's very curious because I, I, I have not expected this uh, ever. Uh, so uh, can you... Sh uh... I'm trying to... Uh... <laughs> well, uh, maybe... and, and none, none of these models, uh, simple models, can... Uh, give you this information. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you think that the structure of the soil is changed with temperature uh, to explain uh, this uh, like to... That peculiar data? I don't think you are seeing it. Are you? No, uh, not I yet. <laughs> Oops, this one. Yeah, I think it's this one, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, this cannot be explained by regular physics option. So it's, it's not physics option. But there's still a lot of debate as whether this effect is due to diffusive effects. In other words, uh, when you rise the temperature, then you are able to reach uh, regions faster you are able, CO2 is able. <laughs> but it's that supposed to be in equilibrium. It's supposed to be in equilibrium, yes. So and you the, say that maybe it's, it's a local equilibrium, it's not, a, uh, it's not equilibrium exactly. Many things can kind happen. Of local information, uh, a local minimum. First, let me draw your attention to, 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 to what happens in, in the, the solid. Uh, you try to fill these holes, which are the pores, cylindrical pores of this silica, with these huge polyamines, which are polymeric amines full of tentacles and, and, mm -hmm. and amino groups in, in the extremities. So there are some theories that say that when you rise the temperature, this uh, structure, yes, changes a little bit of phase, and, and allows or makes more of these amino groups accessible to CO2. Uh, how does CO2 interact with these? There's a whole lot of work that say that it can form carbamates, it can form uh, different, uh, there is an interaction that goes beyond physical uh, adsorption or electrostatic, electrostatic interaction only. So uh, very likely you have a, a, a thermal activated reaction, which is reversible, of course, because we, we have done for some of these material cycles of uh, 
pressurizing and depressurizing and eventually with some hysteresis it comes back to the original point. So yes, this, this behavior has been observed in this type of materials, materials that are impregnated with such polymers that have a high concentration of uh, amino groups. But it's yeah, not, very trivial. Interesting. It's not but trivial to model it. I agree with you because uh, unless you know the real thing that is happening. Uh, yeah. So they, uh, yeah, you are, I think you are right. The, the structure should change a lot to, uh, to be constant with, if it's in equilibrium, to be constant with this data. That's very, very interesting. I'm excited to look at this problem. Very, very nice. Uh, and a comment, uh, I like uh, your example uh, that show that uh, ideal solution model is uh, more constant. I, I love that because we know, we know that uh, uh, Langmuir for mixture that people use a lot has some uh, issue about uh, constants, thermodynamic constants. Uh, and, but we ha I had no ec a good example for that. <laughs> That's a very important point. <laughs> so I know that some inconstants with these like me for mixtures, but I, 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 lo I love the example because I, now I have an example that be constant. Thermodynamic <laughs> uh, distance. <laughs> So uh, let people ask. I have a, one more, but I, 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 I like people uh, participating. So, uh, please. I think Celio is trying to talk. <laughs> I don't have a question. Uh, the Yana's presentation was, as usual, a wonderful presentation. I just would like to add a comment on Fred's question and comment. It's very common to see when tensorption is present to see this behavior. We've seen that in other systems as well. For instance, in, uh, when we have oxygenated compounds on uh, materials on, uh, let's say, on carbon, even, even with carbon, let's say, for treating water to remove, to remove some oxygenated compounds, the increase in temperature decreases, increase in temperatures increase the adsorption capacity because uh, it's, it becomes then an activated process and the increase in temperature uh, helps the activated process, like a reaction. So it's not very common. That's actually, uh, let's say, a fingerprint that tensorption is present. As long as you ensure that it's in real equilibrium state. <laughs> of course, then you have that. Yeah. That's why I doubt the diffusion explanation. I, I, I think we have to go for the, for the real equilibrium, for the thermodynamics. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in the, in, in, in the, for chemical uh, equilibrium, uh, we have a chemical reaction, uh, so uh, uh, it's different, yeah? Uh, so uh, it's possible because the entropic part can, uh, 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 well, be very important in, in, mm -hmm. in this point, but uh, for physics option, uh, it's not expected unless the structure change a lot. So, uh, you have uh, an entropic contribution from the structure. That's very no, interesting. Totally correct. Yeah, for physics option, it's not likely. But for yeah. the absorption, it is. Yeah. That's why for me, it's not an easy question to use chemisorption in cyclic processes. I mean, this has not been attempted yet. Yeah. What you see sometimes are, you know, cy cyclic batches. Uh, take this uh, a fixed bed with this material, absorb, desorb, absorb, desorb, to check whether you have some kind of reversibility. But uh, it, it would be a step forward using it in a real cyclic process, especially because it's an expensive material after all, and, and therefore you can do simulations based on fundamental parameters that have been measured 
in small quantities. Nice. Can I ask? Yes, sure. Hello, Professor. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. Uh, if What's I'm your name? Wrong, for some I'm reason, Lucas. I cannot see you. Oh, hi, Lucas. Oh, sorry. I'm Lucas. I'm from Atoms Group. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned for the PSA model that the, the mass gradient was neglected, right? The mass gradient was neglected. Mass and heat gradient. Uh, I may have mentioned, and, and yes, this is one of the hypotheses, that yes. in all times and in all places there is thermal equilibrium between the gas and the solid. Okay. So but, they are at the same temperature, and, and this spares me from an additional uh, heat balance or separate heat balances for the gas and, and the solid. I have but a, in a that single case, one. Did you consider any mass transfer resistance? For the model. Yes, yes. Yeah. The very simple one. I considered resistance inside the particles, diffusion, diffusion inside the particles by a simple linear driving force approximation. Okay. Uh, just like the derivative is uh, proportional to the difference between uh, the, the, the equilibrium concentration and the concentration at that time. So that when equilibrium is reached, there is no mass transfer anymore. Okay, thank you. And one more question uh, about the moving bed. Uh, I think uh, talking with Professor Ajimiro, you already said that uh, a, an experimental setup may be not feasible to build because of the flowing of the, the solid may, might be something difficult to construct. But uh, what do you think about a uh, simulated moving bed? Can you talk a, a little bit about it, please? Yes, simulated moving bed is usually suitable when you regenerate your sorbent either by purge or by displacement. When, when you involve uh, heat as the main drive for desorption, I cannot think of how you could implement that without uh, the heat escaping to the wrong sections, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, correct. So, uh, yeah, it, it's essentially, uh, it, it would be a nice option, yes, if, uh, if your sorbate was not so strongly absorbed that you could extract it by simply purging or using a third component, which in this application I cannot think of. <laughs> to displace CO2. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I think my mic has a little confuser here. Oh, I can hear you and I can see you. <laughs> Ingrid. Yeah, right. Uh, my, my cousin, Azevedo. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the YouTube channel. Yeah. So can I ask you from that? Yes. So the question is from Vitor de Moraes Sermount. He, sa uh, he said, uh, nice. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Thank you very much for your seminar. I would like to ask, what's the challenge of these new ab absorbents, PAFIS, MOFIS, to be implemented in engineering processes. I think he's talking about MOFs. Yeah, and PAFs. P-A-F. I didn't know this, this, this acronyms. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> let me restrict my answer to MOFs. <laughs> okay. Uh, the main challenge is uh, to use MOFs, first of all, is their cost. They're very, very expensive. If you try to purchase uh, a bottle with 100 grams from BASF, it will have four or five or six in their menu only, although there are thousands of possible combinations of the organic linker and the inorganic part, and they will cost you a fortune. And so the, the main thing is, you know, uh, having what, what you can 
do in the lab in, in a larger scale. Uh, the other thing about MOFs is that on a volumetric basis, they're very frequently too light. So uh, this example that I showed of the paper of Professor Rajadran, yes, this one. You can see that they have much lower productivity in terms of moles of CO2 capture per volume adsorbent. So since they are much lighter, for instance, than, than uh, Zeolite 13 x which is inorganic, inorganic, <laughs> let's say. So they lose a lot of, uh, you would need bigger units very likely that occupy more volume, a larger fingerprint than uh, regular adsorbents like Zeolite 13 x So they're wonderful materials, fascinating materials, especially for, not only for synthesis, but also for molecular simulation purposes because the sky is the limit, the way you can combine things and uh, open metal sites, uh, hidden metal sites. But uh, on the other end, there are lots of challenges, especially in reducing the cost, reproducibility of the synthesis, and they are very light. Uh, no no uh, surprise that when you measure their surface area through these usual measurements, uh, what we call BET equipment, you can reach thousands, uh, sometimes 5,000, 6,000 square meter per gram. So that's nearly air. <laughs> it's very, very porous. And, and so even though they can uh, accommodate a lot of gas molecules, they also will occupy a lot of space. Good, okay. Thank you for the answer. And so we can go for one more question. Anyone? Hi, Diana. Hey, do you Hi. have a question? Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, who's talking? I can't see. Dariva. Dariva. Dariva, how are you? Good, good. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Always a pleasure to see and, and to hear you. Very nice Thank talk. You. Thank you. Uh, just a quick, quick question. Uh, I'm wondering about the applications of these adsorbents to higher pressure systems. Uh, do you think that we really need new adsorbents or we can design process in higher pressure with this material we have today? What's your impression about that? Uh, I think we can, we still can take more juice <laughs> out of the, the, the standard reference materials. And sometimes you can modify these standard materials like activated carbon is very prone to surface modifications to enhance things like selectivity. But if you look at these isotherms here, which, uh, yeah relatively high, oh, this one, the first one I showed, relatively high pressures. Um, MOFs, th this is not a best example, but uh, they, they can reach quite high uptakes of nearly whichever gas you can think of. If you rise the temperature and uh, the temperature, no, the pressure high enough. Mm -hmm. uh, this activated carbon, you can see that it's still increasing the amount that it can take. Yeah. And so and there are regular activated carbons that can be produced from lignocellulosic feedstocks. Uh, depending on the way you synthesize them, uh, you don't reach the 5,000 square meters that I mentioned for MOFs, but uh, a good activated carbon will have a lot of pores and therefore accommodate, the higher the pressure is, the more they can accommodate gas molecules with 2,000 square meters per gram. So yes, I think there is still room for improvement using re uh, conventional packings, but with, uh, you know, original cycle configurations or more sophisticated cycle configurations, let's say, or by surface modifications. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, uh, Professor Heza has a question, so you can go on, Professor. Uh, 
that in, in Portuguese. Uh, thank you for your per, uh, your uh, nice presentation. Uh, I have seen uh, a nitrogen uh, generation in oil fields. Uh, please explain uh, more about the uh, effect of uh, nitrogen and uh, uh, helium in a CO2 capturing in your uh, research and uh, effect of this, uh, 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 this component uh, in increasing recovery, please. I'm not sure if I understood the, the, the question. You, you want me to comment on the uh, role of nitrogen? Yes, yes. Effect of nitrogen and helium uh, in CO2 capturing and uh, in uh, increasing in CO2 capturing, okay? Okay. Uh, nitrogen and helium are thought of being inert, usually, and within a, a small pressure range, they are believed to be inert gases. You won't find helium uh, ordinarily in, in real CO2 capture scenarios. I mentioned helium here, uh, possibly, because helium uh, is often used when you make CO2 breakthrough curves in the laboratory. You can't use pure CO2 uh, because you should protect your, your equipment, the, the, the analytical equipment that follows the column. So it, it was just a solvent, let's say. It was just a carrier uh, to to, to perform experiments. But uh, as a matter of fact, helium is disappearing from the planet. So you won't find it in real process situation. Now, nitrogen, yes. Uh, I haven't gone into that much further, but very often since it's absorbed so little, we often disregard the presence of nitrogen. And uh, the person who caught my attention to it was Professor Rangedran, and I, I mentioned his paper. So uh, if you look at the isotherms of the four materials under study for CO2 and you look at them for nitrogen, uh, well, for this activated, this MOF, which is the red light, it's nearly negligible. But if you take a look at the magnesium MOF, it can make a difference. And if you don't take that into account, you may uh, underestimate or overestimate, better said, by simulations, uh, what the performance of your unit will be. So yes, nitrogen may be important because your adsorbent may absorb it in significant amounts. And, and this is very likely to happen with highly, highly porous solids such as MOFs. This is the case with this MOF, not with this other, but it should not be ignored. I mean, competitive absorption should be taken into account with proper multi-component models so that uh, you don't get surprises. Okay, thank you. I don't know I if a... I answered your question, <laughs> Professor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have another question. Uh, I understood that uh, by decreasing the temperature, uh, increased recovery of uh, CO2 capturing, and uh, in and uh, by uh, high high pressure, uh, high pressure increase uh, deviation. Uh, please explain more about the effect of temperature and uh, pressure in uh, your procedure in CO two capturing. Well, actually, I should point out that the second part of the talk happens at constant or approximately constant temperature, even though when adsorption happens, there are local concentration gradients, and that is taken into account in my energy balances. But as a whole, pressure swing adsorption happens uh, at constant temperature. And uh, you mentioned deviations. What I recall from deviations, uh, I think it's backwards. Now it's here. Fred uh, called the attention. I have some other hidden slides of other cases. But uh, as you increase the pressure of the feet, and this is normal binary breakthrough curves, so just taking a fixed bed and feeding it with uh, a CO2 nitrogen mixture and checking what comes at the outlet. So as you increase the, temp the pressure, this one was obtained at six bar, 12 bar, don't look at this, <laughs> 12 bar and 18 bar. 
and the corresponding ones for nitrogen. So what you can see is that you have uh, wider deviations as the pressure increases, uh, which are less so if you use an ideal adsorbed solution model other than the, the, the regular Langmuir extended or SIPS extended model. That's what I meant from deviations. And this cannot be serious for a single fixed bed, but if you connect two beds, three beds, four beds, in a PSA device. So these deviations will probably uh, uh, give you the wrong numbers about the unit productivity if you don't take into account uh, the right competition. Uh, you said something about temperature, which is the last part of the talk, in which pressure keeps constant, but temperature is the main drive for desorption. And in, in this case, I'm not sure whether you mentioned this. Uh, in the three graphs, you have recovery against purity of CO2 in the heavy product. And what you can see is that as you increase the temperature of regeneration of that section where you must provide heat, uh, as you increase it, you tend to get better for performance in terms of purity and in terms of recovery. Uh, very likely this is so because you manage to clean the adsorbent more effectively than at lower temperatures. But there must be a limit going beyond or going to high temperatures will probably stress your adsorbent and you get nothing more by doing so and you spend more energy. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fred, is it possible to another question or no? <laughs> yes, a short question. <laughs> uh, you have mentioned about the surface area and magnesium. Yes. Uh, have you any research on a carbonate, surf uh, carbonate surface in your research? Or have if you I have... Please yes? repeat, repeat the uh, question. Uh, you have mentioned about surface area yes. and magnesium. Uh, yes. Ha have you any research uh, on carbonate uh, surface? Uh, well, in our lab, we have facilities to measure uh, uh, surface area of all the materials that, that, that we test. So uh, carbonates, whatever. I don't know if this is the question, but it's not really research, even though there is research on how to handle the adsorption data of nitrogen at cryogenic temperatures, that's, that's the uh, standard analysis that you do to determine surface areas. Uh, we use it regularly for the sake of characterization of our materials and relating these textural characteristics, uh, pore volume distribution, surface area with their performance as a, an agent of separation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yuri, I think it's time, you know? Yuri or Ingrid? Yeah. But uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone is. <laughs> we have one last comment from Professor Carla on the okay. YouTube channel. So yeah. I read that and we can wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, she said, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I would like you to talk a little more about how to obtain some parameters of the models, such as the intraparticle diffusion coefficient and the dispersion coefficient in the column. Okay. Uh, I have a hidden slide on that. Uh, and I may discuss it with Carla. I think it's Carla Mansky, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Okay. Carla, we can discuss it in more detail, but essentially uh, axial dispersion, uh, we, we, we just calculated from uh, correlations. Correlations found in the literature from the other dimensionless numbers of the problem. And uh, intraparticle diffusion, in the case of these sorbents, and uh, uh, in the case of the system, gases in, in zeolites or activated carbons, uh, it's not an issue. It's quite fast. Uh, I'm talking about uh, 
Let me give you uh, an order of magnitude. I'm talking about 10 to minus one seconds to minus one. So this is relatively fast. If I had a system like the one that interested Fred, uh, those, <laughs> those pores that are filled up with, with something else and CO2 will have to, you know, swim in there to reach the adsorption site, that poses a, a challenge on measuring the correct uh, kinetics or the correct mass transfer coefficients. And uh, we usually do that. The, very, the regular procedure is to uh, take the uptake. When you're measuring your isotherm and you pressurize the system, so you see how much time, how long it takes to reach equilibrium. And this gives you an indication, uh, depending on, on, on how sophisticated your description is of the mass transfer uh, mechanisms. This gives you uh, already an indication. But uh, there are various other ways. Uh, we've been proposing a method that combines uh, manometry and calorimetry. Because when you pressurize an adsorbent, upon adsorption, the temperature will rise. And uh, this is also connected with the way that the sorbet uh, moves inside the adsorbent. I think those two parameters were asked. But anyway, I have some hidden slides here that I can handle to her. Carla, send me an email. <laughs> uh, because some of them are really measured in the lab, uh, especially those connected with uh, surface properties of the solid. Uh, void fraction inside the solid, void fraction of the bed, uh, the isotherm itself, the, 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 the coefficient, which in this case is in a known order of magnitude, but many others, we just don't have the facilities to measure, especially thermal uh, parameters, thermal characteristics. We usually take them from the literature. And you may test if they work or not by using an empty column, um, simulating other strategies where you get rid of adsorption itself and test whether your thermal parameters make sense or not. Okay. So we would like to thank you again, Professor Diana. We received a lot of uh, nice messages saying that your presentation was very nice and a lot of congratulations for that. So thank you again to be with us. And now we are going to wrap it up. So it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I would like to say my last uh, words of gratitude. Thank you, Fred. And by thanking you, I am thanking all the people from the Atoms group and also from uh, UFRJ. <laughs> so thank you. And congratulations to all of you for this nice and beautiful university that we have in our country. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>